something. attention. Lord, we are thankful to be here this morning, this evening. <laughs> we thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. You're always here. You're always ready and waiting for us. Your promises are true. So we want to praise you tonight. We want to give you our attention, all that we are, all that we have. We, we dedicate this time to you, Lord. Our, our Father, and we give you praise in your name. Amen. Amen.
Let's move around a little, say hello to someone. Thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, Lord God. And we thank you for the word of God, Lord. We pray that, Father, your word would bring us to the path, the place that you'd want us to be tonight, Lord God. That you would teach us things, Lord, that only you can teach us by your Holy Spirit, God. Give us understanding and knowledge of the Holy One, God. And, Father, teach us about you. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. If you buy your Bible tonight, turn to the Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10.
The book of Revelation, remember, is a book of the future. It can be wonderful for us, us as Christians to know the future. But it should be bittersweet. Sweet in that God will spare us a church. That those born-again believers will be in heaven. But bitter because of those people who will be left behind. I want to remind you that the book of Revelations separates people. Sometimes people think that God never separates. The Bible even speaks to us about be ye separate for a purpose and for a reason. Now, I want to give you a little bit of background before we go into the chapter 10. The Apostle John all of a sudden found himself caught up into heaven before the throne of God. I want to touch on that just for a moment. John is on the island of Patmos, and all of a sudden he's in the presence of God. You know, sometimes the presence of God is, is just so unbelievable. God allows us at times to go into the throne room, and I'm not saying you can't go into the throne room. Don't misunderstand me. We have access to God, the book of Hebrews says, with confidence and boldness that God does hear us. That we can go into the throne room of God and God answers our prayers. God will hear us. But sometimes God allows us and makes himself known even more than ever before, and there's nothing like it. And at this time, John is all of a sudden took up into the throne room and God is going to show him, Jesus is going to show him many things that are going to happen in the future. Now, talking about the throne room, every single person is going to stand before the throne room, every one of us. Now, we're going to stand before the throne room in the sense of if the rapture happens, as a group, but we will one day stand before the throne of God all by ourselves. If God decides to call one of us home, in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it said it is appointed for man to die once and then the judgment. And what that literally means is every person who dies stands before the throne room of God. And you and I as Christians will be received with joy and gladness, not out of in any way condemnation or guilt, but with joy from God. So John is picked up and he's taken to the throne room of God. He says, then John saw Jesus with a scroll in his hand that had been sealed with seven seals. As Jesus broke the seal and unrolled the sc scroll, events began to take place on the earth, and at that time, that we call the Great Tribulation, things began to unfold concerning the future. Now, the Tribulation is a time, a seven-year period of time, when God's wrath is poured upon an unbelieving world, and God begins to make not right all the things that have been so wrong. So stop a moment and think. I want you to look at our world today. And as you look at our world, and whenever I look at the world, I remind myself that I used to be part of that world, and so were you. And I participated in some of the things, not to the extent as we see today, I don't believe, but I participated in some of the sins of the world, and I've been set free from them, and I've been forgiven, and so have you. So it keeps me in the place of when I think that way, that I used to be, be that way, and I'm not perfect. So it keeps me in a place of thankfulness and humbleness before God. But God's judgment will come upon what is doing, being done today and what is being done wrong in the abortions and the Pride Week or Pride Month, so-called, the murders that are going on, and they will increase, beloved. 
God will judge them. This will be a seven-year period called the Great Tribulation. Now, I want to remind you, whenever we go through the judgment of God, we are blessed to be able to see what is going on, and we're not part of it, but we're also not under the judgment of God concerning it. Now, last week, uh, we learned that the keys to the bottomless pit was given to Satan, and it was opened, and 200 million demons were released upon the earth. These demons were allowed to sting men without the seal of God, which would cause them to be tormented for five months. During this time, no one would be allowed to die, even though they would seek death. We also saw the sixth trumpet, sound and four angels, demons, that are chained today, were released from the four corners of the earth. Plagues were also released on the third part of mankind. Plagues were released on the third of mankind is killed. So I want you to get a picture of this. Today we have eight billion people in the world. One third of those population will be killed at this time by these four demons. That would be 2.5 billion people. Today in the United States, there's 320 million people. Think about that, every single person in the United States being dead, but multiply that eight times. That's how devastating it's going to be during the Great Tribulation with God's judgment. Whenever I think about the judgment of God, it's because God is a just God. But I also am very thankful to God that we're not under his judgment as Christians. Those left on the earth, even though all these things were happening, would not repent of their idolatry, their murders, their sorceries, their drug use, their sexual immorality, or their thievery. It is almost unfathomable what will happen. When Jesus was asked the question, what will it be like, he said, I can't explain it. I can't give it into words. The greatest communicator ever that there ever was was Jesus, God in the flesh. And he can't explain it. But even seeing all these things that are going on, this devastation, they won't repent. They won't turn away from their sins. It seems unfathomable. You see the destruction, you see the judgment, they know it's the judgment of God, and they still won't repent. At this time, I believe they're probably in Romans chapter 1. They're reprobate. That means a mind without God. God leaves them over to reprobation. So we left off in Revelations last week with the sounding of the sixth and seventh trumpet, which ushers in the end of all things. Now instead of the seventh trumpet, we have an interlude in Revelations chapter 10 and chapter 11. Well, let's start on verse 1. Now remember, this is a Bible study. We're going to study the Bible. Verse 1 says, And I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud and with a rainbow was on his head. His face was like the sun and his feet like pillars of fire. So there's an almighty angel that comes down from heaven Many believe that this is Jesus, and so do I. Some believe it's Michael the Archangel, but the majority of pastors, prophetic teachers, believe that it's Jesus. And the reason why they believe it's Jesus is because he describes himself like that in other places in the Scripture. Let me read a few places to you. 
Him coming down from heaven the same way. John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Matthew 24. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. And Revelations 1, 7. Behold, he has come with clouds, and every eye will see him, every, even they which pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. But I want you to notice something that's really important. And when Jesus comes down, that there's a rainbow on his head. When we look at rainbows today, it's almost like we're ashamed of seeing a rainbow because it misrepresents the truth. I want to show you and remind you, most of you know this, the meaning of a rainbow and why we are given by God the rainbow. In the book of Genesis, chapter 9, verse 14 and 15, it says this, It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant which I made between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all the flesh. So God made a promise to us, mankind, that he would never again flood the earth and again destroy all flesh by water. And it's never happened since then. So every time a person looks at a rainbow, we're to remember the promises of God concerning this. Now the Bible does teach in the book of Peter that one day God will destroy everything you and I see. It will melt with fervent heat. God will destroy or, or judge the world in the last days by fire. Now, I wonder if this angel, the rainbow, isn't some sort of reminder that as bad as things are getting, there's still hope. God isn't just going to wipe away everything concerning this. And I must remember this today. You know, I, I see the world and so do you. And it can be really thought of negatively of what's happening. But God has made us a lot of promises and God is a fulfiller of his promise as we shall see. So there's always hope with God. You know, one thing I've looked at as I've seen so many prophecies in the last days that are happening right before our eyes, I'm remembered that God said these were going to happen. That none of these are accidents or coincidences. God's not saying, oh my gosh, I didn't realize this was gonna happen. That's not how it is. What it does is as you read the scripture and you see what God says is gonna happen and it happens, it strengthens your faith in God and your trust in God. That's what it should do. That's why God gave us this, the future. Now, God is a promise keeper. He keeps all of his promises. Whatever he has promised in his word to you, it will come to pass. And whatever he has promised in the future will also come to pass because God is faithful. I've been walking with God for about 45 years now. And I know that there are some of you in this room who have been walking with God longer than me. And I can honestly be, say before God and before you that God has been faithful, me, faithful, me, faithful to me every single day of my life since I've been a Christian. And I believe that he's been faithful to his word before I was a Christian in my life. For God saved me many times from myself and from death because I had, God had a plan for my life. It's like yours. But God is faithful. Listen to the scripture. This is in Romans 4, verse 19 through 21. It says this, And not being weak in faith, talking about Abraham, he did not consider his own body already dead. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So I want to share with you real quickly three things that 
Abraham had concerning his faith. The first one, he says, he did not consider his or Sarah's age to be an obstacle to God. I want to remind you of something. Sarah was 90 years old. And Abraham was 100. If you go on and you see Abraham's life and you know the history of Abraham, he's 145, 150, and he takes on a new wife and has five more children. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. But the Bible teaches here that Abraham did not see it really as an obstacle to God. So here's a question for you. Is anything an obstacle to God that God can't do, even though it may seem impossible? Let me say one thing that God cannot do, and I can say a few more. God can never go against his word. Never. Let's look at the second one. He did not waver at any of God's promises. God said it, and he believed it. You know, faith has a lot to do with God answering our prayers, God answering you. I'm not saying faith in your faith. I'm talking about faith in God and faith in the, the Word of God. Many prayers are not answers because right before God wants to answer, many times we don't believe God and we stop trusting God. And although God sometimes still answers, So Abraham believed God, that God could get his wife pregnant in the sense of him and his wife at their age. And the third one, he gave glory to God. He praised God even before seeing the evidence that God would keep his promise. That's a real act of faith, isn't it? I don't see any evidence God made a promise in his word to me that I'm a new creation Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I haven't seen that recently, so to say. You may think that in yourself. I'm more than a conqueror. Well, uh, uh, through Christ who strengthens me. You see, there are times that God says, you know what? There's no evidence. But I want you to believe me in what I told you I would do. Though it took a miracle, God did keep his word to Abraham. And he will keep his word to you. One day, we'll see the fulfillment of his promises to you if you will just follow the keys to faith. It says here, his face was like the sun, bright and clear. This speaks about, again, Jesus. And it's mentioned again in Revelation chapter 1, verse 16. It says this, he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. What do you think it's going to be like when the first time you see Jesus? He's going to either going to smile at you if you are born again and you belong to him, or he's going to frown at you. But imagine this. I don't believe that when you stand before Jesus, you're going to go up and shake his hand. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to go and do that. I believe that he probably will embrace us. But I, I'll have different eyes. I'll have different everything. I'll have a glorified self and our spirit, not a glorified body yet, unless we get raptured. You'll have a glorified body if you, we get raptured and we're in heaven. We'll see him face to face. And I don't know, I always feel like I might melt away as he looked at me in the eyes. But we will see him and he will shine and be bright. And the Bible teaches his feet will be like pillars of fire. How many of you know what pillars or brass represents? Brass represents judgment. Jesus came as a lamb his first time and he was crucified. He'll come as a judge a second time, and he will judge. Now, verse 2 says, And he had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on, his hand, on the land, 
And he cried with a loud voice and with a, with, as with a lion's roar. When he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. So it says here that he had a little book open in his hand. Now, the Bible teaches in Revelation 5 that he had a scroll. Remember, he, and he opened it up, and then it started un, opened up the seals, and this is when the judgment started to happen. Many believe this is not a book. It's a different book. We don't know what it is. It says here that his right foot was on the sea and his left foot on the land. So Jesus' stance projects his authority over both land and sea, his authority concerning direction, now, one foot is on the land, one foot is on the sea, which means a complete authority over the entire earthly situation. Now listen, I believe, again, that this shows God's in control of everything and all that happens in the book of Revelations and all that is happening today. People have made this statement. If God is God, then why is he allowing these things to happen the way they are? I want to remind you as a Christian today, the Bible teaches that you were made in the image of God in the book of Genesis. And part of that image is literally a free choice, a free will. God is never going to go against your free choice. And he's not going to make man do what they're supposed to do. He's not going to make man love him. And man has been given that free choice, and man is making that choice, and man has chosen to follow the God of this world, many of them. Not all. Those who are Christians, they follow. They're following Christ. But God is still in control of all things, not man's choice. I also believe that God is in complete control of the future and the present. I believe he is in control of everything that happens in my life as I yield and surrender myself over to him and to his word. And that is true until I get to heaven. Have you noticed that well, some lives are so much easier, so much better, it seems like? Have you noticed that they seem to go over the bumps a lot easier than others? Why is that? They're both Christians. The reason is that because many times one surrenders and one doesn't. One rebels and one doesn't. One says, yes, Lord, and the other one says, we'll see. I believe that God is in charge Things are not out of control, but according to the word, are falling into place. Now, please listen. You can believe this truth and walk in peace and enjoy the ride. Or you can be anxious and worried over everything that happens or might happen and become a basket case. And I've seen some become this same thing. Listen to this. Today in the United States of America, one third of people today in the United States live in the bondage of COVID. In other words, remember how full blown it was? And how everyone was staying in their homes, restricted in masks and everything else. Today in the statistic, I read that one third of Americans are doing the same thing as if COVID was full blown. You talk about bonding to slavery. You talk about being captivated by fear. Here it is. And God never entails that. As we believe God, that he is in control, that freedom comes. And you can walk in the peace that God wants you to walk in. And the rest. Now, it says that he cried out in seven thunders, uttering their voices. This relates the same idea of a thunderous voice of God as described in Psalms 29. And seven times it repeats the phrase, the voice of God. Listen to it. Let me read it to you. 
Psalms 29, 3 through 9, it says this, The voice of the Lord is over the waters, the, the God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Simeon are Syrian, like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes a deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone enjoys or says glory. Now verse 4, now when the seven trumpets uttered their voice, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, seal up the things which the seven thunders utter and do not write them. This illustrates the principle that while God has revealed much in secrets, which God has not seen fit to reveal to a man at this time. So in other words, this. There are times that God wants us to know things, and there are other times that God says, I don't want you to know. That's just how it works. John knows what he has said, but we don't. God said, these will be sealed because man cannot handle it. Look at me. How many have ever wished they didn't know certain things that they now know? Raise your hand. I do. I wish I had never seen certain things. Many years ago, I went to some party, and I was not a Christian, but it was a stag party. Somebody was getting married. And you know how that is sometimes? And, and I wish I would have never went to that party. I never didn't do anything horrible or nothing like that. It wasn't that. It was some of the things that they showed us. And I was like, oh, my gosh. That was 60 years ago. 50, no, 55 years ago. And I still have memories of it. There are times that God says, I can't handle certain things. God knows what you and I can handle. Honestly, he does. No, I need to know about that. Okay. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says this, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Beloved, many times we want to have everything in life all figured out. But sometimes that just doesn't happen. Honestly, there are some questions that even great men of God can't answer. Some people have questions for God and they want answers. Why did my child die or why am I sick? Why has my life been so rough? Sometimes there are answers and sometimes they are not. Are you okay with having imperfect knowledge about things? You have heard me say, I'm okay with that. And the reason I say that is because I'm okay because I know who I know and I know who knows me, and that's God. God is leaving us in the dark when it comes to these thunderings because of his infinite wisdom. Sometimes we have to be, to simply learn to trust God. He may not always give us the answer to your entire question, as we need to be okay with that, as Jeremiah, as Joseph, as Elijah, as all the men of God and all the people before us who were Christians. Now, don't get me wrong. There are plenty of real answers for us concerning questions that we have concerning Christianity. But God doesn't tell us all the answers. When we get to heaven, we're going to know a lot more, I promise you. The Bible teaches we have the mind of Christ, but we're really going to have the mind of Christ when we get to heaven. We're not going to have this carnal mind to deal with. So what do we do with things we don't understand? Trust in what we do understand. 
when the ancient mariners were caught in a storm at sea. They would let out their anchors to keep their ship from going off course. These are the anchors in our lives when the storms are raging. There's four of them. Anchor number one, God is all-powerful. Whatever problems I'm facing, God is bigger. There's no problem that God can't handle. He can do anything. In Jeremiah 32, 17, it says this, Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and your outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. How many know what the word nothing means? It means nothing. Number two, anchor. God knows everything. God might be strong, but he does. He know what is going on in my life. Think about that. Have you ever thought this? God just can't see what's going on. God doesn't understand what's going on. God can't. Yes, God does know. In the book of Psalms 139, it says this, verse 1 and 2. Oh, Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You, might, you know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts are far off. God knows everything that's going on in your life today. That's one of your anchors. Let's look at the third anchor. God is good. He is not just powerful and wise. He is also good. He is not evil. Everything God does for us comes through his goodness. 1 John 1, 5 says this. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness. God does never and will never harm you in any way. Everything he does for you is from goodness. And the fourth anchor, God loves you and me. Anyone can say, all right, that they love you and me. But when the rubber meets the road, is there proof and there evidence? Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you are struggling with unanswered questions, you're not alone. Learn to trust in what you know. Learn to trust in the anchor. You may think you don't need to know the tr this truth as you grow through life, but the younger you learn these and apply them to your life, the easier life becomes. I can't tell you how many times when I don't understand what's going on that I've used these anchors for my own personal life. That God loves me, that God is good, that God is working for good. Now he goes on, verse five, and he says this. The angel whom I saw standing on the seven, on the sea and on the land, raised up his hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declares to his servants, the prophets. So we see, literally, Jesus raising his hands to the one who lives forever. This mighty angel gives a solemn oath declaring that the end is an irrevocably set in motion, that there should be no delay no longer. There is absolutely no turning back now. If you've been a Christian over five years, raise your hand. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. <laughs> I ask that because every one of us probably have been waiting for the Lord to come back. Lord, and the question has come to my heart, Lord, why are you waiting so long? And if we've been a Christian for a, long, for a period of time, we all, almost, all know the answers, don't we? God is long suffering. So none would perish, huh? But I wish it stopped being long-suffering. Sometimes I really do. It seems so evil outside. 
There'll be a time when God says, okay, that's it. And there'll be no stopping it. It says here, who created all the heavens and the things in it, the earth and the things that are in it, the sea, all these things. So we're seeing all kinds of things found new in the, in the universe. I don't know if you knew that. In outer space, we're sending the Hubble telescope out. And they are finding out so many different things, unbelievable, about black holes. But they found a big star, and as they say, it's the biggest one in the universe, at least they, as far as they know. And it makes our sun look like, like a pea. They call it Big Daddy in our English. I say that with this in mind. I want to remind you of who created Big Daddy, who created the universe, who holds all the things in his hand. In the book of Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. God created them. Not man. This word here, create, means to create, shape, form, fashion, and God is always a subject of heaven and earth. All the things you see in heaven, space, all the things you see walking or crawling, all the flying birds, all that swim, God created them. Now please listen, in six days, in six days. So when you see them on TV, and they say they evolved over so many millions of years, I don't think so. God says different, and God was there. Who am I going to believe? I don't know how people can be so blind to the miraculous creation of God and not accept that there is a creator. Notice what I said here, not accept. They have to know that someone made these intricate animals like the dolphin, with his teeth exactly the same size, every one of them. But one side is just off enough of the other side where they get their sonar. How can people believe? But I don't think it's really believe. I think it's that they won't accept the truth. And I think sometimes the truth won't be accepted because they know one day if they accept that truth, they'll have to accept this truth that they'll stand before their creator and give account of their life one day. So he says here, he goes on, the mystery of God would be finished. So what mystery is he speaking about here? One important aspect of this mystery is that he has been declared to be the servant of the prophet. It is hard to say what the precise mystery of God is because the phrase or its equivalent, is used for many different aspects of God's plan. Let me give you four or five of them. The ultimate conversion of the Jews is called the mystery in Romans 11:25. God's purpose for the church is called the mystery in Ephesians 3, 3 through 11. The bringing in of the fullness of the Gentiles is called the mystery, Romans 11:25. The living presence of Jesus in the believer is called the mystery of God. That's a real mystery. We know it's true, but it, man, it seems like it's a miracle. Colossians 1, 27. And the gospel itself is called the mystery of Christ, Colossians 4, 3. In this context, the mystery of God probably refers to the unfolding of his resolution of all things, the finishing of his plan of all the ages. Now, we're almost done. He says in verse 8, And the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me, and again, and said, Go take the little book which is open into the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. So I went to the angel and I said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be sweet as honey to your mouth. So John here is commanded to take this little book from Jesus and actually eat it.
So it's an invitation to give, to take the little book, and John does. But it's also an invitation for us also to take the book. That means taking the word of God, chewing it, and swallowing it. Now, let's stop there just for a second. The word of God at times, well, it's always, I believe, sweet. When I read Proverbs, I think it's the sweetest book in the world. I think the Gospel of John is one of the sweetest books in the world. I love every word in there, and I chew it and swallow it, and it's very sweet to me to the Word of God. But there are times as I read the Word of God, it's bitter also. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. The first one, in the book of Hebrews, it says, God chastens who he loves. I love God to chasten me. Let me explain that. That doesn't mean I want God whooping me. That's not what I'm talking about. I love God chasing me because I know that when the chastening is done, God's going to work something out of me that needs to be worked out, and I'm going to become more like Jesus, and my life's going to be much sweeter for myself and for others. Whenever God works in your heart and purges you, it's painful. It hurts at times, especially when it's a deep work that God works. And God may be doing that to you today. And when I go through trials, I look at the end result. It's going to be sweet. Because I'm going to be more like Jesus. I'm going to be freer. My life's going to have more blessings upon it spiritually. And that's how the Word of God works many times. It is sweet and it is bitter. Now, verse 10 says, Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand, and I ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many people, nations, and tongues. Now the Bible speaks in other places about the same thought of a prophet eating the word of God. This is in Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It says this, the prophet was also commanded to eat a scroll, revelations of God to Israel. This figure of eating the book of, is familiar and suggests the feeding of the soul and the word of God. Now, this little book is initially sweet to the taste, but becomes bitter in John's stomach. Every revelation of God's purpose is bittersweet, disclosing judgment as well as mercy. And it ends with that you must prophesy again about many people, nations, tongues, and kings. Whatever the context of the scroll, it is connected to John's command to prophesy to all men. This is not a message just focused to the church. John's prophecy speaks of the fate of the entire world, not just one nation, empire, or emperor, such as the Roman Empire. Jonah was told to go and prophesy to the people of Nineveh, and he would not go. Instead, he went to the opposite way and was sleeping in the boat. But the sea got rough, and all the men on the ship were totally frightened. Their world was being tossed to and fro, but Jonah was still sleeping. Beloved, today, the world as we know it is being tossed to and fro, and there are many people out there who are looking for answers. They are afraid. But many in the church are not telling them what God has told us all to tell them about him. The church is sleeping. Beloved, did you know that you can be asleep and not even know it? You can be in the church and read your Bible and pray and still be asleep. God wants us to be fully awake and to occupy until he comes. What does that mean to occupy? 
to be occupied with anything, to carry on a business, to carry on a business and as a banker or a trader or a Christian. So God speaks to John, or Jesus speaks to John and tells him that he is going to prophesy and share with many different nations, and he does. And he did and he does, today even. Let me end this with this thought. We aren't going to know everything. That's just how it is. God's not going to give us answers, although God has the answers to every single question you have. That's just how it is. And am I willing to accept that from God? I am. I have no problem with it because of the God that we know and the God that knows me. We must remember also that we must seek God's word. And when we do, at times it's going to be bitter and it's going to be sweet. But we need to eat it every day. You need God's nourishment. You need God's strength every single day of your life. You need the Word of God in you. And that comes by reading, by studying, by memorizing Scripture. That's how it works. That's how it works. I can say this, and I'll end with this thought. I read my Bible every day. Well, you have to. You're the pastor. No, I don't. I need God's word in me every day. I need to be fed every single day of the week. And I read my devotionals every day of the week, four or five of them. I study four or five times a week at least because I want to know the word of God and I want to be fed for myself so I can feed others. I can't give you what I haven't been given. Neither can you give anyone else anything if you haven't been given it yourself by God. You know, when a mother bird goes out and collects worms for her babies, she goes out and gets that worm, and then she comes back and feeds her babies. When a Christian goes out and feeds other people, they go and they have to feed first themselves, like the mother bird goes and gets those worms. That's how it works. You can't rely on what you did 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Well, I know about that. I read that. I went to the book of Revelations. I've studied through the book of Revelations. I've taught through. This is my fourth or fifth time I've taught through the book of Revelations. And it still feeds me every time I get into it. And God shows me something different every single time. I can't tell you how many times I've read the book of Revelations. But I need to be fed every day. And so do you, especially in the days that we live. Father, we are grateful for the Word of God, Lord. And tonight we want to, Father, remind ourselves and commit ourselves to you concerning not knowing everything, Lord God. There are questions that you've answered many times for us, Lord God. And you answer them through the Word of God many times. And I thank you for that, Lord God. But there are times, Lord God, we don't know why. But we do know some things, Lord God, that you're good, that you love us, that you know us, what's going on in us, Lord God. So remind us of those anchors, Lord, that we do know, Lord, that they may keep our ship, our rudder in the right place, God. And Father, we want to commit, Father, knowing you and things that we don't know to you, God. We thank you, God, for being our God. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Okay, any questions?